So this conference grows out of a three-year research project funded by the FCT on the history of anthropology and the historical anthropology of colonialism in East Timor from the mid-19th century to uh, 1975, when the Indonesian invasion uh, put an end to a long period of Portuguese colonial presence in what was then designated as Portuguese Timor, Timor Português. So this meeting marks a, a, a moment in a collective trajectory that has been shared by some of us in this room uh, as a teamwork, a very um, rewarding teamwork with involving Gonçalo Antunes, Claudia Castel, Vicente Paulino, Carm Pissarra, Rita Poloni, Frederico Rosa, and myself. And uh, also, uh, the Sabina de Fonseca was not, was not been a formal member of the team, but was been turned into a de facto uh, 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 team member uh, for a number of, of issues. So, uh, in fact, this conference is not so much of a synthetic closure. It does not be, it's not a synthetic a synthesis of the, of the project. Um, and I thought of rather than bringing it to a closure uh, in, in, a matter, in a manner of a synthesis, uh, I thought of making this a moment for sharing some research questions and research issues that we have that more than pointing to what we have done in the past are pointing to what we'd like to explore in the future. Um, and uh, uh, in particular, it is just an occasion for discussing research directions that point to the significance of crossing historiography and ethnography, archival documents and field accounts, by taking as point of departure the Portuguese archival legacy of colonial anthropologies. And we invited uh, uh, colleagues who have, in a way, who are in a way also uh, confronting this, this type of issues. So during the last four decades, anthropology's colonial past has been uh, uh, scrutinized by many people. Uh, early scholarship strongly criticized colonial anthropologists and anthropology, social, cultural, or biological, for having been idiotically complicit with the violence of Western colonization. Without discounting colonial power, however, in recent years, new scholarship has been calling for a final reappraisal of the complexities of anthropology and colonialism. Beyond the specters of imperialist ideology and anti-colonial anti criticism, it is time to reassess the colonial predicament of ethnographic knowledge. So this conference explores the tensions and productivities of such a contemporary reassessment of anthropology's colonial past. The rich history of anthropology in East Timor offers an appropriate laboratory for a wider reflection on the virtues and vices of the, con the connections and equivocations, continuities and discontinuities between colonialism, post-colonialism and ethnography, as well as between historical and ethnographic methodologies. The conference thus aims at exploring the past and present of ethnographic research in East Timor in relation to, their colonial, to its colonial past, as well as its contemporary significance. From the late 19th to the early, 20, to the early 21st century, the ethnic, and linguistic, and cultural diversity of East Timor attracted considerable anthropological interest. During the long period of Portuguese colonialism, from the 1500s to 1975, a rich variety of published and unpublished works of an ethnographic character was produced. However, ethnography in the Portuguese colonial period was not a Portuguese preserve only, of course. Notably, in the period 1950s, 60s to 75, East Timor was the object of a number of influential ethnographic studies by French and English-speaking anthropologists, some of whom we have the honor to have here with us today, Professors Colin Friedberg, David Hicks, and Elizabeth Traub. Between 1975 and 2000, Indonesian occupation hindered foreign ethnographic research in the territory. Only more recently, with the restoration of Timor-Leste's independence, not only some of these uh, uh, pioneer researchers have returned, as also a new generation of ethnographers has been re-exploring Timor as a field site. At the same time, the Portuguese historical archives are being re-examined. In crossing histories and ethnographies, we hope to address how former colonial knowledge may shape current uh, scholarly understandings, how old archival materials may reopen to new understandings, how visible or occluded colonial events may reactivate pre present realities. In so doing, it is my hope that we will be helping the formation of a post-colonial moment for the history and anthropology of Timor-Leste today. So after these words of introduction, I would like to uh, uh, introduce you our keynote speaker, Professor Elizabeth Traub. Uh, uh, and this is really a really great pleasure, and especially knowing how hard it was to get here after 
uh, having fighting with f flight connections and missing flights, etc., etc. To have <laughs> Professor Elizabeth Schraub here um, from the United States, from Wesleyan University. Professor Traub uh, received a first a BA in folklore and mythology, and then she took a PhD in anthropology from Harvard University in 1977. Her dissertation was about East Timor, and she then did field work in the early 1970s when Porch Timor was, in fact, Timor Portuguese, a Portuguese colony, uh, and he worked, she worked among the Mumbai people. Cosmology and Social Life, Ritual Exchange Among the Mumbai of East Timor, published by the University of Chicago Press in 1986, was the monograph that resulted from her uh, intensive years of fieldwork in, in Timor. The book explores in detail the myths, ritual practices, and worldviews belonging to Mumbai's sacred lineages, and it offers an innovative engagement with the themes of exchange in cosmology through an analysis of the ritual and uh, mythic in integrations of the Portuguese colonizers as outsider rulers, returning younger brothers. The book has been since become a landmark and, and a source for continuing inspiration uh, for East Timor scholars and I'd like, I think, also beyond the field of East Timor uh, studies. And uh, I speak for myself particularly, who have been greatly inspired by, by Elizabeth Schaub's work. And I, I think actually it would be difficult to think, uh, we would think very differently about, about Timor's colonial, colonial history were it not for, for uh, this, uh, this work. So over the decades when research on Timor was precluded due to the Indonesian presence, Professor Traub became involved in cultural and media studies, quite a turn. Course. Her book, Jimming Identities, Class, Gender, and Generation, analyzed a number of, of Hollywood movies released during, during the Reagan era as a contradictory terrain where new possibilities and identities mingled with calls to a, for a return to a represented past. She continues to have an interest in television studies, but after 2000, Professor Chow returned to East Timor and resumed her fieldwork research, if I may say. She went back to the same interior town where she had lived in 73, 74, and has since been actively involved again in the study of East Timor. And she has been particularly exploring the diverse ways in which Timorese have made outsiders into insiders. And uh, she has also published a number of important essays on nationalism on, on, and, and more recently uh, a co-edited volume with, with Henry McQuillan uh, on land and life in East Timor. So Professor Traub's talk today is titled Outside In, Timorese Expectations of Returning Outsiders. So it's on the theme of return that we welcome Professor Traub and thank you. Thank you so much for that really generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I should say the one shift in the title is it really it's Mumbai expectations of returning outsiders. And that's, you know, historians always have their dates. Anthropologists always have their locale. Um, OK, so. The people of Timor-Leste have proved themselves adept at incorporating outsiders into local cultural orders. They've had considerable practice. Over the past century alone, three foreign powers, Portugal, Japan, and Indonesia, have occupied their land. The violent departure of Indonesia in 1999 brought in a multinational UN peacekeeping force, followed by a UN transitional authority, which oversaw the transition to full independence. After having been largely cut off from the outside world during the Indonesian occupation, Timor Leste has seen a huge influx of outsiders during the transitional and post independence periods. UN administrators and police, international development organizations, NGOs, returning Timorese diasporans, not to mention anthropologists, a few of whom, like me, were also returnees. I first went to what was then Portuguese Timor in 1972 to do fieldwork for my doctoral dissertation during what turned out to be the last years of Portuguese colonial rule. After three months of indecision, spent mainly in the town of Laleia on the northern coast, I relocated to the district of Aileu in the mountains 32 kilometers south of Dili. Aileu is part of the Mambai zone, which extends from the north to the south coast across the approximate center of the island. Laleia is in the Galoli region, 
one of the few in which Catholicism had been the majority religion since the early 20th century. But in Ileu, converts were still a small, primarily elite minority. Mumbai, moreover, had a collective reputation as a people fiercely committed to traditional ways. They were the archetype of what East Timorese call Kaladi, a, town, a term used to distinguish the peoples in the western interior from both more cosmopolitan coastal town folk and the supposedly more enterprising peoples in the east, called Feraku. Neighboring ethnic groups, Kaladi themselves, regard the Mambai as the original autochthonous people of the land. This collective identity, I learned, was a source of pride among many Mambai, especially those from origin villages associated with ritual authority. Over the course of my first field work, I became closely associated with two such places, paired ritual centers named Hohul and Ramos. My ties to these origin villages were mediated by two men, Maubalan of Ramos and Mauberi of Hohul. Maubalan was introduced to me by the wife of the Leorai of Saloy, in whose household I resided. His father had been a head priest of Ramos, but had resigned his position, according to Mabalan, for reasons I failed to explore. Mabalan took me to Ramos and later to Hohul, where I met Malberi, who was the eldest son of a Hohul priest. I spent most of my second year in their company, attending a variety of ritual events. I left Timor in late 1974, a year before the invasion. I returned for the first time in 2001 during the transition. I rejoined the household in which I had lived, and I also renewed my relationships with Hohul and Romance. Mauberi had died two years previously in Dili, where he had moved, according to his younger brother, to avoid punishment for his participation in the early stages of the armed resistance. Mabalan was living in Maleri, just outside Aleo town. As I walked down the road to his house for the first time, people came out to watch, and I heard the children excitingly telling one another, she's the one who was here before, the one who was here before. In many ways, I am still working through my protracted association with Hohul. Excuse me. In ways I am still working through, my protracted association with Hohul and Romos has been drawn into pre-existing stories of their relationships to outsiders. One of these is an origin narrative referred to as the Walk of Rule or Walk of the Flag. Originally narrated to me by Mabalan and Malberi as part of a sprawling creation myth, it represents the Malay Bultin, white overseas foreigners, as returning outsiders whose ancestor was born on Timor and who are called back by Hohul and Romance ancestors to establish a heavy rule and a weighty ban. The other story, set in a recognizable historical past, involves a figure named Felish, whose outsider character is more elusive. He is, all tellers insisted, black, like us, not a Malay, yet nonetheless a foreign stranger, who comes to Aleo with the first missionaries. When hostile chiefs drive the missionaries away, he remains behind in Hohul, where he arouses enmity. Sentenced to death for witchcraft, he survives a series of attempted executions and disappears. I have written about these traditions separately, but in this paper, I consider them together as parallel responses to foreign intervention that incorporate outsiders into the indigenous world. I will situate the traditions in relationship to overlapping initiatives undertaken by the colonizers during the late 19th century, the extension of Portuguese colonial authority, and a renewed effort at evangelization. Representing foreign intruders as returning ancestors is the most, most literally incorporative strategy, and it is not limited to Timor. In a study of Andean responses to Spanish colonialism, Peter Goes calls it a worldwide indigenous strategy that articulates a politics of connection, of recognition, solidarity, and reconciliation. The colonized, Goes argues, use pre-existing cultural resources to recast the colonial relationship as an intercultural alliance, a pact of reciprocity. They treat invaders as ancestors in attempts to make them responsible and to subject them to indigenous social claims. Such a strategy can justify defiance as well as submission, since it holds outsider rulers up to standards they rarely meet. The role of the colonized in the making of colonialism remains controversial, especially where they seem to collaborate in legitimizing colonial rule. Certain caveats are in order. Firstly, my knowledge of the Mambai mythological traditions is based on ethnographic rather than archival sources, 
And I cannot say precisely when the myth emerged. <coughs> a distinctive feature of Portuguese colonialism on Timor <coughs> was the long lag between <coughs> the long lag between colonial presence and colonial control. And various ideas about the foreigners must have circulated over the interval. Portuguese involvement with Mumbai people certainly increased after 1769, when the embattled Portuguese moved their capital from Lifau to Dili, which was then part of the Mumbai zone. Ileo chiefs participated as loyal allies in the late 19th century military pacification campaigns. A construction of the foreigners as ancestors could have mediated the collaboration, or it could have been developed subsequently to justify it. The question of authorship is also complex. Obesekeri, in his polemical critique of Salins, has argued that it was the Europeans rather than the Hawaiians who initially deified Captain Cook, and he largely discounts the importance of pre-existing cultural categories in shaping indigenous responses to foreign invaders. Without entering into the particular debate over Cook, I do appreciate Salins' insistence on the role of the colonized in colonial history, and I think the tendency of Timorese peoples to cast outside influences in indigenous cultural terms has been well documented. Such constructions are never rigidly determined, nor are they independent of the colonizer's practices, as we will see. The Portuguese actively attempted to conform to what they took to be the indigenous ideas of sovereignty. But what most disturbs Obisekeri is his assumption that any ideology that legitimizes colonial rulers would necessarily devalue the indigenous peoples, and this seems to me misplaced. In incorporating foreigners as ancestors, indigenous people dignify rather than demean their own position. As Gonzalo Lamana puts it, they use cultural frames to produce respectable selves, opening up a space in which the non-Western subject is coherent by being different and equal. Whereas Obisekeri sees European colonialism intervening in native beliefs, excuse me, Obisekeri sees European colonizers intervening in native beliefs to glorify themselves. But Ranajit Guha argues that the British actually made little attempt to win ideological support from the majority of the colonized population in India. Co controlled by coercive mechanisms, subalterns, in his view, experience colonial rule as dominance without hegemony, and their local cultural forms retain autonomy from elite culture, both colonial and national. Inasmuch as subalterns nurture grievances rooted in experiences of exploitation, they have a predisposition to rebel and can be mobilized by nationalist elites, but subaltern participation, Guha emphasizes, is motivated by an, an autonomous politics of the people, which leaves its imprint on nationalist movements. While I sympathize with his last proposition, I believe that subaltern responses to colonial rule are often more ambivalent than Guha supposes. In this paper, I approach colonialism as an intercultural production in which both colonizers and indigenous people engage in a socially located politics of incorporation. Rather than posing an obstacle to nationalist sentiment, I will suggest, ideological legitimation of Portuguese colonialism could help to nurture it, in part by providing an external measure for judging Indonesian rule. In this next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about these two narrative traditions. At one level, representing foreigners as ancestors is a corollary of a cosmogonic tradition in which all things are interrelated. Mumbai cosmogony is of this type. Origin narratives represent animate and inanimate beings alike as descended from the primal couple, Father Heaven and Mother Earth, whose union on Tatmailao centers the world. Timor and Malaya, speakers say in ritual chants and formal greetings, we too have one mother, we too have one father. Such formulaic assertions of kinship are common in ordinary speech as well, although the origin narratives that elucidate them are viewed as specialized knowledge. Many cosmogonies deal with the question of unity and division by recounting the separations that make human life possible. Mumbai cosmogony assigns the function of creating divisions to Father Heaven. He imposes a ban of silence on the non-human world, which makes it possible for human beings to appropriate their kin. We eat our elder brothers, as Mumbai liked to say. Heaven also differentiates his human sons, who include three brothers – 
The two eldest brothers draw black water and remain black, while the youngest, who draws white water, bathes white and washes clean. The eldest brother receives knowledge of blacksmithing and goes off into the West. The middle brother receives luck and fortune in the form of sacred ornaments and other articles of ritual dress, which he seizes from Father Heaven. He and his descendants found houses in Romos and Hohul. The youngest lays hold of all the regalia of political office, including the flag, and he disappears across the water and the sea. On Timor, in the absence of tokens of rule, people neither tremble nor fear, and anarchy prevails. To end it, the eldest brother, or in some variants his descendants, use their mystical powers to, to, to transport themselves over the seas to Portugal, where the Malaya kin present them with regalia of office, staffs, drums, and a flag named Raimundo, literally land of the outside world from whence it came. With these tokens, which inspire fear and trembling, he establishes his domain, an association of origin groups that recognize the supremacy of Hohul and Romance. Tellers emphasize that through the quest overseas, their ancestors came to hold political power as well as ritual authority, founding the domain. But at some point in the past, the ancestors grew weary and sat down to watch over rock and tree. They surrendered the rule embodied in the flag and other regalia, thus delegating power over human affairs to indigenous newcomers. The newcomers become the rulers of the kingdom of Aileun, which is named for a twisted tree located in their origin village, which has also given its name to the larger administri administrative district, Aileu. So when I say Aileun with an N, I'm referring to this one kingdom within the administrative district of Aileu. Later, this is still in the myth, the Malai themselves return and take up their place in Dili as the supreme holders of justice. The indigenous political rulers of Aileun in this model go down to the sea to report to the Malai and go back up to the interior to report to the old lords of rock and tree. I understand this narrative tradition as a version of the mythology of the stranger king, the widespread Austronesian idea that their rulers were originally strangers who come from outside the realm, often from overseas, and are installed as sovereigns over the original people of the land. In these narratives of the founding of the polity, encounters between outsiders and insiders result in a diarchic division of leadership in which spiritual authorities associated with immobility and interiority ritually oversee the cosmos, while jural political executives associated with mobility and exteriority regulate human affairs. As James Fox observes, the origin of the outsider is variously constructed. In many cases, he is a complete outsider from another realm or from overseas, but many other versions identify him as an earlier ancestor who leaves for a period of time and is received back into society as a returning outsider. In a variant of this set, the returning outsider is a relative, a brother or a son who was exiled or went away. What distinguishes the Hohul Ramos tradition then is not the provenance of the stranger, but the nature of his installation on the coast as a jural political ruler. A more common pattern on Timor involves what Fox calls the installation of the outsider inside. That is, the stranger from the outside is installed as insider and often displaces the original authorities as the ritual authority. The latter then take on <clears throat> the active executive role of defending the realm, while the immobilized stranger just sits. The Malaya undergo no such functional transformation in the myth, although they are symbolically immobilized in relationship to the indigenous jural rulers of Aileun who go back and forth. Moreover, in acquiring and redistributing regalia from overseas, the Hohul Romos ancestors arguably become stranger kings of a sort, and they play out a version of the wider pattern in which ritual authorities claim to have originally held and redistributed the power of rule. That claim, which is a source of great pride among Hohul and Romos people, is contested, as we'll see, by Aileun rulers. <coughs> The Tat Felish story, so far as I could tell, is universally known in Aileu 
and I have recorded many variants, especially on my post-occupation visits, when it sometimes seemed as if every topic led back to Falish. As a much-told tale, it has many variants, but there is a relatively stable core. It describes the people's first encounter with missionaries, one of whom is named Shakop. Felish is a lay missioner who assists them with their conversionary who assists them. Their conversionary efforts meet resistance from leaders in both Ileu and Hohul, that is, from both Jural and ritual authorities, who fear that he will usurp their rule. Father Jacob leaves and goes to Suibada, which becomes a center of learning. Felish stays behind and settles in Hohul, where he starts to build a chapel just outside the village. Besides preaching the new doctrine, he performs assorted miracles, and in some accounts, he also settles disputes regarding ritual prestations. One or more of these acts antagonize the Hohul leaders who accuse him of sorcery, resulting in his arrest by the Ileun ruler and appearance before the Malai military commandant of the colonial court. He is unjustly condemned to death, either by the Malai or the Ileun ruler, and he cannot be killed. Among the contested points, and tellers tended to be familiar with and to refute other versions. This is, you know, people would say, I know what you've heard, but that's not right. Here's the right version. So among the contested points is the distribution of guilt. In some accounts, there are two priests, one of whom is killed by the Ileun chief, something that descendants of the latter strongly deny. While my impression is that most people regard Felish as a saintly martyr, Others, including Maubalan, explicitly now identify him with Jesus and accuse the Hohul ancestors who turned against him with having killed God. In Hohul versions, he disappears after riding his horse into the church in Ileo town, while Maubalan and others say he assumed the form of a young boy named Maubedi. When and how often he has reappeared are disputed, but his story is always unfinished. Whereas the flag narrative narrates the establishment of order, the Felish tradition revolves around an unresolved injustice that creates an enduring imbalance. I'll talk a little bit now about the intercultural dynamics of colonialism. Not all East Timorese regard the Malaya as returning ancestors, but interest in European insignia of office was widespread among Timorese rulers from both poles of the local diarchies. With roots in indigenous ideologies of rule, such interest was also promoted by the historical strategies and practices of the Portuguese co colonizers, which Ricardo Roque has elucidated. While generally accepting my ethnographic analysis of the incorporation of the foreigners as legitimate rural rulers, he argues correctly that legitimation was the product of interactions between the colonizers and the colonized. And whereas I focused on a discourse carried on among themselves by ritual leaders, he has foregrounded Portuguese dealings with indigenous representatives of the Jural political plane. Central to Roque's analysis is the weakness of Portuguese colonial rule, even as it was extended over the second half of the 19th century. Chronically underfinanced and understaffed, concentrated in Dili with an uneven presence in the interior, Surrounded by often hostile kingdoms, the Portuguese relied on alliances with indigenous rulers. The peculiar strength of such weak forms of rule, Roque argues, depends upon the colonizer's capacity to incorporate elements of the colonized other. Inasmuch as the colonized simultaneously pursue their own interests by incorporating elements of the colonizer's system, Roque characterizes the dynamic as mutual parasitism. The executive figures of the indigenous diarchic polities better fit European conceptions of rule than did symbolically immobile sacral authorities, and the Portuguese dealt primarily with the former. They distributed military patents ranked from colonel to lieutenant and insignia of rule, notably staffs, military drums, and flags in return for loyalty to the crown. The recipients agreed to amass and send to Dili an annual tribute in kind, the finta, and to serve the government by providing workers in peacetime and by raising troops in wartime to assist in punitive expeditions against rebellious rulers. In receiving the foreign titles and regalia, these local rulers acquired new authority within their own realms. 
The possibility of leveraging an alliance with the Portuguese to defeat a rival chief was not insignificant, but arguably as important as material support was the cosmological legitimacy that foreign regalia traditionally bestowed upon military force. The new donors, however, remained active in political affairs, and their interventions upset the balance of indigenous diarchic polities. The Portuguese colonial authorities, as Roque demonstrates, were no less preoccupied with symbolic displays of power than were their Timorese allies. Many of them sensed that Timorese were intensely invested in persons and objects representative of colonial authority. The governor and the flag in particular seemed to be regarded by the native peoples as embodiments of a mystical power worthy of veneration. Many of the colonizers came to see preserving and enhancing Portuguese prestige through regular displays of symbolic power as essential to colonial rule. The annual delivery of the Finta to Dili provided one totalizing performance with the colonial administration positioned as the great mother and father who were reciprocated for the order they maintained. But the ordering power which the colonial government sought to embody as well as enforce was associated primarily with war and the exercise of justice. And in both these institutional spheres, the Portuguese depended on their indigenous allies. Warfare was framed as a display of punitive violence against kingdoms that resisted the extension of colonial power. Waged by the Portuguese and their loyal allies, military campaigns were critical performances and tests of colonial power, which was enhanced by victory and diminished by defeat. In indigenous conceptions, moreover, the power of combatants is indexed by the degree of symbolic heat generated through forms of ritual violence, such as headhunting. To channel that power, Roque argues, Portuguese-led pacification campaigns incorporated the very barbarities they would later be portrayed as eliminating. Similarly, in the exercise of justice, a pragmatic politics of tolerance for indigenous custom prevailed, a sense that efficient government of the natives required the colonizers to embrace Timorese manners, while the indigenous rulers, in turn, depended for their legitimacy on tokens bestowed by the governor. Through such military and judicial performances of power, Portuguese colonial authorities and indigenous jural rulers became increasingly intertwined and mutually dependent. Arguably, the interests of Timorese ritual authorities in incorporating the outsiders were less direct and were predicated on maintaining their difference and distance from executive rule, both foreign and indigenous. The Mumbai flag myth, I would argue, reasserts or attempts to reassert an older model of domination based on a hierarchical separation of spiritual authority and political power by symbolically incorporating the very foreign presence that was, under, that was destabilizing it. While the colonial authorities generally respected taboos on what they saw as the religious sphere of native life, foreign spiritual authorities began to penetrate the sphere. In the flag myth, the ancestors go off to Portugal, but in the Falish tradition, the missionizing outsider comes into Hohul. Catholicism has a long history on Timor, dating back to the arrival of the Portuguese Dominicans in the late 16th century. Nevertheless, when the colonial administration began to expand, Christianity was still but weakly implanted. Frederic Durand suggests a number of reasons, including the desire of the Portuguese governors to limit Dominican influence and the transfer of the capital, which meant that missionary efforts had to begin all over again with a new population. A virtual absence of missionaries between 1834 and 1874 further impeded those efforts. A new initiative began in 1877 with the arrival of six missionaries who spread out across the districts. One of these was a Timorese priest, Jacob dos Reis Sicunha. Father Jacob was assigned to Luca and Sami on the southern coast. From there, he went to Aileu, where his conversionary project made little progress. The Falish tradition refracts indigenous resistance. But resistance was not rejection. Durand suggests that dualism allowed the Timorese to accept and integrate the new Christian rites without having to deny their local religions. This applies, I think, both to Timorese converts, whose practices are often notably flexible, as well as to those who remain fully within the indigenous cult, 
who now call themselves Gentiwa from Gentiu. So I'm going to translate that as pagans because I think it kind of captures it. The latter, the Gentiwa, the pagans, literally host their Christian counterparts at indigenous ceremonies. This next section, I talk a little bit about the incorporation of Christianity. From a structural perspective, Mambai rituals reverse the processes of separation and division represented in origin narratives. At multiple levels, the rituals bring together and reunify divided wholes. The underlying principle, I have argued elsewhere, is that the hosts are the part of a divided totality that represents the original whole, the part that both opposes and includes their counterparts. I suspect that a version of this principle is at work in the way that Christianity has been incorporated into indigenous ritual life. As followers of the outsider religion, Catholics are symbolically invited to indigenous rituals whose inclusiveness indexes the status of the host. We are, you know, the the whole that brings everything back together. But it is Hohul that has most dramatically incorporated Christianity and with reference to Felish. Like other Timorese peoples, Mumbai identify Father Heaven, the transcendent figure in the pantheon, with the Christian God. In both Hohul and Romance, Father Heaven's house is referred to by the Tetum term Maromak, from Naroma to grow light, which the missionaries used to translate God. So this house, the God house, is opposed to the dark house of Mother Earth, but also to other more worldly manifestations of celestial maleness. In Hohul, there's a house called Liorai, ruler, which is considered the house of justice within the ritual sphere, the place where disputes relating to ritual obligations are resolved, and it now belongs to Felish. Its unique status is evident in its design. Other sacred houses are uh, divided by a central hearth into an inner southern section and an outer northern one, whereas Liorai is split into western and eastern halves associated with pagans and Christians. On the pagan side, indigenous ritual practice prevails. There are rocks for placing shaved offerings to the spirits, and ritual meals are served to human guests in black bowls. On the Christian side, there's only one rock where candles are lit, no spirit offerings are made. Prayers are recited by a man who is not a convert but knows how to pray, after which a meal is served on white plates to Christian guests, if any attend, or else to housemasters who represent them. Having expelled Felish in the past, Hohul now unites followers of both religions in his house. In a valuable essay on the Felish tradition and its afterlife, the missionary ethnographer, Jorge Baris Duarte, describes these and other Hohul practices as the paganizing of Christianity. I think that phrase is misleading, as cult practice within Hohul is based on opposition and inclusion rather than blending. In Liorai, Christian cult objects and practices are treated as complements of their indigenous counterparts. Similarly, when Mambai refer to particular stages of the ritual of the annual cycle of agricultural rituals as Timorese, Christi- uh, Timorese Christmas or Timorese Easter, They are not referencing attempts to imitate the Christian festivals, as Duarte implies, but rather noting perceived parallels between two coexisting ritual systems, each of which addresses phenomena of life and death in its own way. Most jarring to me was Duarte's account of one Maria Isabel, whom he describes as a native of La Lea and former student of the Canassian nuns. Much like Felish, she set up residence in Hohul, where she halted the paganizing of Christianity by means of her apostolic work. This, according to Duarte's unidentified informant, involved translating into Mambai and Tetum the religious books she had brought with her. But her presence and its enlightening influence were temporary. After her departure, Duarte writes, Hohul reverted to its syncretizing ways and submerged itself again in the paganizing of the Catholic cult. Now, Isabel is, of course, the Mumbai rendering of Elizabeth, and it was widely known that I had lived in Lalea before coming to Ileu. My association with Hohul was also common knowledge in Ileu and beyond. Having never heard of any Catholic woman taking up residence in Hohul, I can only assume that the diligent and pious Maria Isabel is someone's version of me as Duarte received it in the mid-1980s. <clears throat> 
Like me, Maria Isabel is defined by her mastery of the technology of literacy. Ours is the book and pen, tokens that Mumbai associate with the Malaya and oppose to rock and tree, the silent icons of indigenous cult life. We are both transcribers of sacred texts, but with different purposes. I had positioned my project in terms of the preservation of indigenous knowledge, and my work was often represented to me as to write down the walk of rock and tree, whereas she is a would-be agent of spiritual transformation who seeks to bring the word into the silent realm. But her success, like mine, is limited. The paganizing process she interrupts, she, she interrupts is renewed in the nativist movements that Duarte goes on to describe. Here, I am much in his debt, for Felish's charismatic afterlife had long eluded me. In fact, throughout my first fieldwork, I experienced the story which was told to me repeatedly as a distraction from my concerns. I go, no, not again, don't tell me that story. Trained in a variety of structuralist traditions, I understood my object as a cosmological order that manifested itself in ritual objects, spatial arrangements, and social relations, and that was articulated in a language of dual categories. The pervasive dualism of the flag narrative delighted me, as did its apparent incorporation of colonial history into structure. By contrast, the Falish story, always told in prose rather than poetic language, just seemed overwhelmingly eventful. There was a plot, of course, the miraculous donor whom the people failed to recognize, but narrative performances often struck me as incoherent, one sequence flowing into another and another with no clear end to it. What persistently eluded me was that people were telling me about a chain of historical events that was still unfolding in which I too could be assimilated. In 2001, both Mabalan and his younger brother told me on separate occasions that shortly before his death, their father, Tatbesh, had told Mabalan to expect the arrival of a young Malay woman who would help them to, restore the, to resolve the injustice done to Felish. And Tatbesh, they told me, had heard this from none other than Felish himself. Mabalan's father, I now realize, had been involved in one of the nativist movements that Duarte describes, and I suspect that's what led to his giving up his priestly duties. Syncretic does seem an accurate characterization of these phenomena, which blend Christian with indigenous practices in ways that elicit disapproval from both representatives of the church and the traditional cult. They were, as best as I can tell, relatively small in scale and short in duration. Recurrent features involve a mystically gifted leader, in some cases a young boy, identified with Felish and or Jesus, who is transported by his followers on a palanquin similar to those used for making crustaceans in the traditional cult. According to accounts I gathered on my return visits, the protagonists claimed assorted supernatural powers, performed acts of prestidigitation, and bestowed blessings in return for payments in cash or kind. Duarte associates these movements with Hohul, and Hohul members were among the participants, although often from branch houses rather than Hohul itself. Hohul people tend to be critical of movement practices, which they described in Christianized terms as making a false prophet, and many charged the movement leaders with using Hohul's name. At least some of these movements had anti-colonial dimensions. Felish, let us remember, is allied with the missionaries, but the colonial administration participates in his punishment. The Malai military commander either imposes the sentence or becomes the pilot figure, handing the matter back to the indigenous rural rulers of Ileun, who had brought the witchcraft complaint. In either case, the Felish of Mambai oral tradition has no reason to trust the colonial government. In attributing anti-colonial sentiments to his reincarnations, people cited perceived violations in the pact of reciprocity between Malai and Timorese. Back in the 1970s, people spoke bitterly about the abolition of the finta, the old tax paid in agrarian produce, which was instituted by the Portuguese in the 18th century on the model of pre-existing tributary structures. They spoke bitterly about its abolition and its substitution in 1912 by a cash head tax. Malbalan, in particular, repeatedly invoked Felish's disapproval of the money tax 
In contrast, attribute in kind, he said, the tax precluded distributing a share to the birds and mice, and the hungry creatures now raided the fields. In, resentment of taxation was not confined to movements, and it had many motivations. In Hohul and Romans, people remembered the tributary arrangements as ceremonial enactments of their hierarchical status, while they portrayed the head tax as serving the interests of the Ilean rulers. It's difficult to separate anti-colonial sentiments from the local diarchic antagonism. In the 70s, I used to hear about a man from a Hohul branch house named Paulo Castro, who people said had been accused of trying to steal the rule from Don Juan of Ileon, and who had been exiled to Portugal. Castro, a minor civil servant, was literate, one of Hohul's few educated people, as he was later described to me, and he was a collector of traditions like me. His punishment was often invoked in the 70s as a reason why many people feared to share traditional lore with me. It was only in 2001 that I began to piece together other elements of Castro's story. I learned that he had participated in one of these movements in which a young boy was presented as Felish's reincarnation in what seems to have been a challenge to Hohul's spiritual preeminence. A number of people said they suspected that he had stolen books from Hohul belonging to the original Felish. According to Malbalin, who emphasized the diarchic rivalry with Ileun, Castro had acquired another book, one that in a well-known tradition, Don Baumeta of Ileun had received from the Malai and then stupidly lost to the ruler of Motain on the coast, thus making Motain superior to Ileun. Castro, said Malbalin, had intended to use the book to usurp the position of the Ileun ruler and was arrested for that reason. But while it may well have been the local ruler who brought charges against him, Castro was in fact implicated in a 1959 conspiracy against the Portuguese government, based in Dili, with ties to Manitutu, Balcao, and Viqueque, and more tenuous ties to Aileu, Likisa, and Hermeta. The, Port the Portuguese had caught wind of the plan, and they conducted mass arrests, which is what prematurely catalyzed the abortive Viqueque rebellion, as it's become known. Castro was one of many Ileo people arrested at that time on charges of participating in this island-wide conspiracy, although the extent of anyone's involvement in the inter-district plot is uncertain. The Ileo representative of the Fretilin Central Committee remembered Castro as having attempted to unite Timor in order to liberate the people, but with a ritualistic strategy that was not adequate to the political task. Moberi's younger brother insisted that no diplomacy had been involved, and he lucidly articulated the mythical logic. Castro, he said, had reasoned that since his ancestors had brought them alive to Timor, he could now send them away and had performed a ceremony to dispatch them. Several members of Ohul were also arrested and were briefly exiled to Tudaskai, including Lake Mao, who was the head priest of Ohul when I first visited in 1973. Small wonder that Hohul priests would repeatedly proclaim their respect for their Malai kin. Declarations of common ancestry were, among other things, a way of denying any subversive sentiments. There were all these events that were lurking behind this formulaic order. I'm going to talk just a little bit in concluding about uh, the occupation. As it turned out, the Malaya announced their own departure. After the Carnation Revolution, word spread rapidly that the Portuguese were preparing to leave. In Romans, where I was attending a house rebuilding ceremony, people formally assimilated the prospect to narratives of succession. Their younger brothers, many said, had grown old. They now arose and descended with difficulty and would have to surrender the rule. In the post-occupation period, people retrospectively described May 2, 1975, the day that Governor Lemos Pires announced the decolonization program. They described it in idioms of reciprocity as the, as the day when the outgoing Malay rulers had bestowed liberty on the Timorese people. But the subsequent refusal of the colonial administration to return and resume decolonization after Fretilin's defeat of the UDT coup constituted a breach that had terrible consequences. Within the mythic constructions, the Portuguese had abandoned their role as preservers of the community, 
it remained to be seen who would take it up. Sorry. Ironically, even before the invasion, there was a sense among Mumbai that Indonesia was insufficiently foreign to substitute for the outgoing Portuguese rulers. And support for Apodetti was virtually nil in Ileu. The massive scale and destructive force of the invasion subsequently nullified any Indonesian claims, which they tried to make, to come in as order-bringing stranger kings. Nevertheless, even people who represented themselves as pro fretilin at the time when they surrendered to the occupiers in 1979, they also told me that had they been well-treated, they could have come to accept Indonesian rule in time. I used to hear that a lot. You know, if they just hadn't killed us all the time, could have lived with it. What precluded accommodation was the regime's unrelenting hostility and violence towards the population. I'm not sure at what point Mumbai began representing Aosa, the eldest brother, back in that myth, the one who goes off into the West, who becomes the blacksmith. I'm not sure when they began representing him as the ancestor of the Indonesians, but in 2001, it was a widely used and wonderfully expressive trope. In Mumbai's symbolic schemes, a returning elder brother ruler represents a categorical reversal, and to many people, the representation conveyed the combination of material power and moral inferiority that they attributed to the Indonesian state. In contrast to the Portuguese, as Mumbai had constructed them, the Indonesians embodied force without any cosmological legitimacy, sheer outside power. Many Timorese, Mumbai included, portray the occupiers, or the occupiers as a corruptive influence. It was understood that life under the occupation required duplicity, but people who visibly benefited from dealings with the Indonesians were morally suspect and local political leaders who flourished could be and were accused of selling the people. Ritual leaders could find themselves in a delicate situation. On the one hand, volunteer forces regularly consulted them to tap the spirit lords of the land, and many people told me that the alliance with the spirit world had helped the resistance to endure and triumph. On the other hand, Indonesian government officials also attempted to use indigenous ritual authorities for political ends. And they seem to have displayed a disturbing interest in Hohul and Romans in particular. When Hohul rebuilt the, the God House, Father Heaven's House, in the 1990s, the Bupati attended a key performance in which a water buffalo goes up into the house for sacrifice. I saw some pictures, and there was the Bupati there watching the whole thing. When I first returned in 2001, I received numerous accounts of how, in the charged period prior to the referendum, the Ileon ruler, who was pro-autonomy, had ordered the Ramos priests to invite the Bupati to the origin village, where the priests dressed him up in indigenous cloths and performed what was described as a ceremony of brotherhood in support of autonomy. Most people expressed the opinion that the priests had acted under compulsion, and they held the Ileon ruler at fault. But the story was also widely cited as an index of how the old, old ones had become improperly involved in politics under Indonesian rule, how that separation between power and authority had been blurred. Durand argues that a gap opened up over the occupation, which was filled by the Catholic Church as traditional political and ritual leaders alike were increasingly compromised, the church, he suggests, came to combine the diarchic functions, taking on the active power of defending the people while also representing immobile authority turned towards the interior. I find this suggestion very persuasive, if slightly overstated. Traditional ritual leaders are still highly respected, in Ileo at least, but few people felt that they could play a unifying role in the wake of the independent struggle. By contrast, the church had taken on the inclusive position. The dramatic increase in conversions under Indonesian rule was motivated by much more than practical interest. It also, it also indexed a heightened sense of membership in the moral community of the church. There was a widespread sentiment that it was the clergy who had stood both with and for the people during the occupation. 
who had come down among them, shared in their suffering, and tried to protect them. During the transition, I found that expressions of respect for the church typically conveyed a populist resentment of political elites, especially leaders of the new political parties. Many of these latter were returning diasporans who had not suffered with the people, but in a repeated charge were now self-interestedly using the people's name. If Mumbai were often disappointed by outsiders like the returning uh, uh, political elites, they continued to nurture expectations of them. Even in the darkest days of the occupation, there was comfort in the knowledge that Jose Ramazorta and other expatriate leaders who comprised the so-called diplomatic front were out there serving as the speaking voice of the suffering people to the outside world. Sometimes these hopes took enchanted form. Followers of Felish may have tried to drive out the Portuguese, but the same logic could be deployed in reverse to channel and bring in the powers of the outside. In one case, in 1976, a movement associated with Felish attempted to open the interior door to the Malay world, the Indonesians having blocked the northern door of the sea. They were going to open a channel uh, from the mountains. Malbalan was part of this movement, which I've written about elsewhere, and so, in a sense, was I. Friends told me that the leaders displayed photographs of me and claimed to be able to contact me for help from the great lands across the sea. Some people said that movement leaders exploited their followers, using my name for selfish gain. If so, the value of their represented relationship to me depended on collective belief in the pact of reciprocity between Timorese and Malaya. Within that much violated pact, even after Europeans return to their own lands, they remain beholden to those left behind. This idea underwrites an interest in returns that is much wider than the Felish movements. Over the occupation, Mumbai and other East Timorese came to see independence as theirs to earn at the cost of immense suffering. But throughout the struggle, they also continued to believe that they had a moral claim on the outside world not as rights-bearing members of an abstract humanity, but as faithful partners in an exchange relationship that continues to evolve. 